Today, we're talking about the transition from playing college sports to diving headfirst into entrepreneurship. We'll wait a couple of minutes for people to join. Um, but feel free to chat to us the whole way through the entire session. Send your name, where you're from, and any questions you'd like our panel to answer. But while we wait, Jenna, do you want to uh, tell us what Comcast Universal Sports Tech is? Absolutely, would love to. So I have the pleasure of leading uh, Sports Tech. It is a multi-stage accelerator where we are 100% focused on investing in and developing the next great sports technologies. It's really built on partnership. So we have NBC Sports, we have Sky Sports, we have golf, as well as NBC, or sorry, NASCAR, and three Olympic sports organizations, USA Swimming, USA Cycling, and USA Ski and Snowboard. And so it's pretty amazing to watch when you bump all of those brands together, it really becomes a beacon to attract the best startups from around the world to apply. They're gonna get amazing mentorship, um, advisory advice from our sports partners. We invest in them and it helps keep us on the forefront of shaping the future of sports. Fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And we're in an exciting time, right in the middle of selection. So that's funny. Yeah, I don't think we can, I don't think you can lose this one. It's, it's an amazing opportunity. I wish it was around when I was doing some startups in this space. Um, so how are we going here? We've got 52. Shall we kick off? Right. Um, let me introduce you to these super women. Today's panellists are Jenna Carath and Jessica Crothers. Um, let me tell you a little bit about their backgrounds. Let's start with Jenna. Jenna is the Vice President of P Startup Partner Development. Jenna oversees both the farm and sports tech. Jenna is responsible for leading strategy for both the, of these accelerator funds defining investment thesis and managing key industry partnerships to build and curate a team of advisors and mentors. She also works on the custom design curriculum and capital investment, all with the aim of attracting the best startups from around the world to innovate in Atlanta. Jenna has worked in companies small and large, ranging from startups pre IPO stage to fortune 500 companies. Jenna ran fast, I think, <laughs> Division one track cross and cross country at Baylor University. Welcome, Jenna. Thank yeah. you. Pleasure to be here. All right, Jessica. Hello. Hello. Is the COO and co-founder of Goodbye Gear, a managed marketplace for secondhand baby and kids gear. Prior to launching Goodbye Gear, Jessica worked for 10 years as a consultant with Booz Allen, where she served as project manager for the Department of Health and Human Services. Jessica played Division I in my favourite sport, soccer, on a scholarship at USD. Welcome, Jessica. Thank, Thank you for both. Me. No worries. Thank you both for being here today. Where, where, am I, where am I chatting to you both from today? So I'm in Philadelphia. It's where our headquarters for Comcast are based. And I'm in Denver, Colorado. Two nice places and two very sporty places. <laughs> exactly. Um, now, Jenna, you kind of were the impetus for this, um, provided the impetus for this uh, webinar. You found a stat around women um, who are in the C-suite, and for those of us not th that are not American, I think that means executive position roles who played college sports. Do you, what, do you have that stat there? I do. So yeah, actually 95% of Fortune 500 CEOs and 94% of women in the C-suite played sport at a high level in their youth. And so, um, and I think we'll talk about a lot of that today, but so much of that is just rooted in teamwork and having a plan and working a plan and resiliency, you know, when the, the race or the game doesn't go as planned, how do you learn from it? Shake yourself off and step on the line again. Nice. Jessica, what do you think's behind it? Yeah, I definitely agree with Jenna. Um, I think sports provides you with a great sense of self-confidence. Um, and I also think you develop really important skills that transfer well into the business world. Um, as Jenna mentioned, some of these good time management, you know, for me, comfort with always being on the go, traveling, always having to be in a new place within a very short period of time, always juggling a million priorities and, 
and always trying to achieve the next big thing. So. Very true. Um, so I know I started sport as a young girl, as I'm sure you two did. And as Jessica, you just mentioned, it gave you a sense of self-confidence, which it gave me. And I, I felt like it was something no one could ever take away from me, what, what I could do on the sport field. Do you think there's something in that starting young as girls and what does that give you, getting our girls into sport early? Yeah, it definitely provides you with, you know, a sense of, like I mentioned, self-confidence. Um, I also think, you know, being active and exercising daily is, is as research tells us, very good for your mental health. And so I think as girls are growing up, um, there's a lot of value to uh, helping regulate all those crazy hormones that we uh, are dealing with as, as young girls and teenagers and getting out and being forced to exercise every day is a good thing. Definitely. Yeah, I would say it, it taught me um, really resiliency. And I mean, when you first start off in any sport, um, you're, you're a novice, you're new, you've got to kind of stick with it long enough to sort of see some successes. And so it's in that incremental improvement. Um, and you need that same sort of resiliency in the corporate world as well. So that aspect of it, I, um, I think really attributes to the confidence of you've put in the hard work when you step on the line, you know you're ready to be there. It's no different when you step into um, a big important meeting and you have an important role at the table, you're prepared and you're ready. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you two have a favorite sporting moment that you can share with us in your careers? Jenna, come on. Oh uh, yeah. So favorite sporting moment, I would say um, my heart. So I ran track and I ran cross country. I will say my heart kind of went to cross country. Um, I love the teamwork of working together. Um, you know, your top five score, your, your next to displace. Um, so I love the teamwork aspect of it. Um, we got to do a race um, at Notre Dame. And it was really, truly just an experience where we raced well. It was in horrible conditions um, but and freezing cold, but we really rose to the occasion. Um, and I think we surprised a lot of the other teams that were there. And it was just sort of a, a big pivotal moment where we, um, we all just ran our best. And so we could kind of, at the end of it, step off the line and say, you know, proudly we accomplished this together. Nice. Did you win? We did, we did, yeah. Jessica? Um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, back in high school, when I was going through the recruiting process, it was um, a very exciting time. And, and I, I remember playing in a game and the coach of my top choice school, which was USD, um, was there watching. And after the game, he came up and we were, we were just chatting. And, and then he very nonchalantly offered me a full ride scholarship to go to go play at USD. And that was really a life changing moment for me. Um, you know, my family did not have a lot of money um, for me to be going to an amazing out of state school. So that was, you know, not anywhere on my radar. Um, and so, of course, I accepted and I went on to have an amazing four year experience that really changed the trajectory of my life and led me to where I am today. So, um, yes, very definitely remember that moment. It's a real goose. I can feel the goosebumps of that from here still. That's amazing. Um, did you both feel when you were at college that your the sport was as important as your education? For me, absolutely. Vice versa? Um, education was always top of mind. I, um, I started off with a small scholarship and earned my way into paying more and more of my education. So I knew I was there for the education as much as I was there, frankly, to run for Coach Hart. Um, he trained Michael Johnson and Jeremy Warner. So it was an amazing um, program. He used to always say that he would recruit for great citizens first, great athletes second. And it was really about bringing in the right people who had the work ethic, including the focus on education and being good teammates. And, um, and I think it was, he was really intentional about the team that he pulled together um, because that, that culture that you create is so important. And um, so absolutely education was top of mind. And I will say in all of, because when you run cross country and then you do track, you're doing indoor and outdoor. So you're pretty much 
running and racing all year long. And so it was in the semesters where I had the toughest workload that I got the best grades because I was just focused <laughs> heads down. I didn't have time to waste. I had to be really, really productive. And when you're running for um, Baylor University in Texas, um, it happens to be a very large state, which I didn't really appreciate. So there were some very, very long um, bus rides to get to and from meets and had to just learn how to get past the car sickness, keep my head down and um, take advantage of those moments and times to study and, and keep my grades top. Fantastic. And I can tell everybody that you are still a wonderful citizen. I can see See what he saw that in you. And what about you, Jessica? Did you take see them equally as important? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, for women especially, there aren't a lot of lucrative professional sports careers beyond college, um, at least way back when I was in school. So I think my sport was really just a ticket to receiving a good education and ensuring that I had um, plenty of options once I graduated. So definitely felt it was important to stay focused and get good grades and, and make sure I graduated. <laughs> and you have to get the grades, don't you, to stay in the teams? In oh, yeah, absolutely. They, um, they, it, you're required to keep a certain grade, grade level or grade point average and attend class and all that. So. Nice. And what kind of athletes were you both? And have you taken those characteristics into the workplace? I would say um, I was always teamwork first. Um, I knew I needed to do my part to be ready and prepared so that um, I could hit the time that I needed to to contribute to the team in the way that I needed to. Um, so yeah, I think that would be um, teamwork, resiliency, um, you know, having fun in it too, though. I think um, that, uh, it, and I would say the, the other thing that I really took from um, all those experiences, as much as I share the one where we all ran a great race and came across the finish line and we're so proud of it, it was also just as much the races where I didn't run very well, where I let myself and my teammates down. Those were the ones that are the learning moments, right? They stick with you even more. You kind of relook at every single, like, oh, that's where I lost position. If I had just done this, if I had just not had that moment in my head where I doubted myself and I pushed through. And so those are the things that I think um, you carry into your executive life as well, um, that, that um, yeah, learn from it, shake it off, and get back to it the next day. Nice. Jessica, what kind of athlete were you? I <clears throat> um, would say competitive, um, for sure, as in you know, don't challenge me to a game of skee-ball unless you're ready to follow the rules and declare a winner. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and, and probably scrappy as well. Um, and I think, you know, my co-founder, Kristen and I both absolutely have both of those traits today. And it, it served us very well, especially early on in the business when we were operating goodbye gear out of our garages and, and had very limited resources to help us, you know, build, build the company. Um, so I think definitely being scrappy and competitive can carry over into, into the, especially the startup world. Definitely can't be precious when starting a startup, can you? You've got to be a bit scrappy and be everywhere. Um, so you've both gone into different areas. Jenny, you've gone into the big corporate world in one of the largest companies in the world. Did you think this is where you'd end up? And what do you like about the big, the big, big end of town? I will say I never really thought that I would get to the level that I have in a company of the size and scale of Comcast and VCU. Um, actually in, in college, I, uh, my major was international business. I minored in German. I thought I was going to be a foreign diplomat. And then I had the opportunity to work at Silicon Graphics as an intern one summer and um, just caught the, the startup bug and being around that entrepreneurial spirit um, in Northern California. And um, so immediately after school, moved to California. And um, as you mentioned, small, large, I've been through chapter 11, so I've seen a lot. Um, I will say that um, I love the 
the role that I'm in now is the best of both worlds. We're sort of a scrappy startup within the resources of a huge company like Comcast and VCU. And I get to work with entrepreneurs and keep that entrepreneurial spirit, the resiliency, the, the drive, the dedication, the open-mindedness of, I've got this great idea and I'm just gonna power through. And so I feel very, very fortunate that I'm in the place that I'm in. Nice. And Jessica, you've started your own business. Congratulations, you've just closed your Series A. It's uh, 6 million, which was announced. Um, so amazingly well done, because that is not easy to do. Um, did you always see yourself as an entrepreneur? I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit, um, you know, growing up and, and into my um, previous career, just constantly spinning new ideas, coming up with inventions in my head and, and wanting to do something on my own. Um, and now that I have found my way into the startup world, I, there's definitely no going back. Um, I absolutely love the startup environment. Um, every day is new. Every day is a, a new challenge. Um, I, I love to be busy. And uh, so I think I've definitely found my way into where I was meant to be. Well, it sounds like it because you guys are kicking, you know, kicking <laughs> off. and I don't think you, you know, you can't, that doesn't come easy and you can't just do that by chance. Um, now, Jenna, you're not going to agree with me on this, but, you know, I think for controversy's sake, I'm going to use the word individual. Jenna, you played an individual sport. Jessica, you played a team sport. Do you think there's differences in those athletes and the way they play in the boardroom? So I will disagree with you on this one, Kylie, because I truly think that um, track and cross country are 100% team sports. Um, you look at a relay race, um, obviously, I would want to post the fastest split, but it's all those combined times together that get you to um, the first place. So I think it is truly teamwork. Um, it's, uh, it's maybe a different dynamic in terms of um, there's a little bit different strategy and play like that within um, soccer itself, but totally a team sport. And so what, so no difference then in the boardroom? I would say in the boardroom, you never get to the boardroom without the work and help and collaboration of so many others. And, um, and it's, it's a shame sometimes because I think in this culture, we have this, this um, you know, lone warrior, I did it, I accomplished all these things without really um, tipping a hat to the people who lifted you up in that process, gave you opportunities, gave you a place at the table. And, um, and so it's one of the things that I try to stay focused on, you know, allyship. It is a noun. You do it every single day by lifting and helping others around you. I think Never there is happen. a myth of that individual in, especially in entrepreneurship, because we see these individuals like, you know, Zuckerberg or um, whoever that seem like these, you know, well, charismatic might not be the right word in, in that instance, but these charismatic individuals, but it really, you know, with um, sports tech and the, and the picking of tech, you're always looking for the team, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. The, the technology, the product, the idea, that's one thing, but you're investing in the team as much as you are into the technology mm -hmm. and their ability to, especially in an accelerator program, to really challenge assumptions. Do they really understand their, their customer? Um, are they willing to experiment? Um, because just one, you know, misalignment or one assumption can really throw off their success. And so we do, we look really closely for who are the teams that are coachable, who are, you know, open to asking questions and looking at it from every different angle. Yeah, definitely. Coachable is a big one, isn't it? Or you set yourself up for a bit of a nightmare there. Yes, exactly. um, and Jessica, what do you think about the, the, what have you taken from, do you think there's a difference, the team versus the individual and how does that play out in your work world? Yeah. So I think for me, disappointing a teammate was far more difficult to overcome than just letting myself down by not playing well. Um, but I do think, you know, there's a benefit of having teammates um, when you're in a funk or not playing well, because, you know, for me, teammates can snap you out of a, a funk much quicker than a pep talk to yourself. So 
Um, you know, I also think you have the ability to play off each other's strengths. Um, and I do see this a lot today as we continue building our team, just ensuring that we are, um, you know, finding people that aren't necessarily good at everything because nobody's good at, at absolutely everything, but finding um, people that have strengths in different areas so we can really build our team and, and feed off of each other's strengths um, and help build each other up as a team. So definitely there's some crossover there. Mm, you can still win as a team, even if the individual's having a bad day. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, and before we came into this, we all had a bit of a chat and I was talking about this book that I, I read about a called Quiet about the power of introverts and how our society, especially when looking for leaders, is set up for the extroverts. Do you think sport is another area that pushes that dominant paradigm of the extrovert or do you think the meritocracy, meritocracy, meritocracy of sport helps you pick a more diverse or more interesting team? What do you, what is sport? Where does your philosophy sit on that? <clears throat> I can jump in first, Jessica. I, I guess the first thing that comes to mind for me is that um, there is meritocracy in sport. Um, it, there's a direct correlation to the work that you put into it and it takes natural talent and it takes a lot of other things um, as well, but it's putting in those long hours. And for me, um, I've never been one that's felt comfortable sort of um, I don't know, um, putting out there my accomplishments, I would rather just let my times speak for themselves. And so for me, um, that, that is my comfort zone of let, let my work product um, speak for itself. And so that translated from, you know, the track to um, the executive kind of meetings that we're in as well of, of knowing that you are ready, prepared, you don't have to you let your work for, speak for itself. Definitely. Yeah, I think, um, you know, extroverts definitely have the ability to be amazing networks and really grab the attention of a group. Um, but if you are only building your team around extroverts, you're gonna miss out on a, a great deal of, of hidden and maybe more quiet talent. And I think one, one of the most fun things about my role today is, is building out our team and really watching um, people from all different backgrounds and all different skill sets and all different personalities come together and really, really mesh well together. Um, and so we, we've tried to be really intentional on building a team that is, um, you know, diverse in many, many areas, um, including, you know, even just personality types. Um, and it's been, it's been great. And it's really rewarding to see people that come in and, and are very introverted and, and very shy and might be a few, a little bit awkward in the first couple of team meetings. And then within a couple months, um, just really grow into these amazing team members that are great contributors and um, are more and more comfortable speaking up and, and, and really contribute a lot to the team, so. And I guess sport has often played a role at the forefront of diversity and inclusion, hasn't it? I think we've spoken about this before, Jenna. Yeah, absolutely. I think it um, it has broken barriers. It has opened doors. Um, uh, there's a lot of history of that. There's more that can be done. Um, we actually, you know, I, I look at what the NBA, um, some of the players that have been really forceful in speaking out about getting out and voting and using some of the stadiums because they're so accessible um, for people to get to to turn them into polling places and things like that. So I think um, athletes have a big platform to be advocates for the right types of causes as well. Jessica? Yeah, I, I would just agree with that. Um, definitely, I think if you have a, a podium and a voice, um, use it in a, in a positive way, for sure. Definitely. Um, so while that um, C-suite statistic that has kicked this off, is incredibly impressive. Women are still underrepresented in top positions and after re often receive less pay. Why do you think that is and what, what can we do to change that? Jessica, do you wanna go first this time? Sure, I, I think uh, that's a really, really big question with a, with a lot that we could spend some time unpacking there. Um, but I, I do think one thing that we're seeing unfold before our eyes right now is, you know, with this pandemic going on, women are leaving the workforce on their own accord at a much higher rate than men. 
Um, you know, and, and for very good, good reason. Um, I think it is incredibly stressful for parents right now and, and challenging to be trying to homeschool your kids and do your job and, and just deal with all the um, external stresses that are, that are going on in 2020 right now. Um, and so unfortunately, women are, are making the decision to leave their careers that they worked really hard to build. Um, and I think, uh, unfortunately, even though we have seen some progress in this area of um, trying to get women's um, more equitable, more, get women more equitable pay and, and more seats around the table, um, the current climate and situation that we, we are dealing with right now is going to unfortunately, um, reverse some, some of those gains that we've seen, so. Yeah, yeah thank you. I've, I, I've personally seen it within Comcast, um, very accomplished, very senior leaders who have been with the company many, many years who are having to make that choice of just stepping up, um, out for a bit because they need to put their concentration on their kids and they have multiple kids. They're, you know, co-teaching at home. Um, it's just a, a burden that has fallen disproportionately, I think, on women. Um, so it could set us back in a big way. Um, on the other side of it, and even leading up to it, though, I think um, there's so much to you need to see it to be it. And um, there haven't been enough examples of, um, of women really kind of breaking through. I mean, you I, I think back to when I was very first interviewing, um, there's that saying, you hire people that remind you of yourself. I was interviewing with all men. I didn't really remind them of them. Maybe there were some sports connections and things like that, that they saw sort of like characteristics that they could associate with. But so I think there's just slight little disadvantages along the way. And, and I think it's why as you get up to the, the C-suite, it thins out so much. It's the small, small little headwinds that just they add up over time. And so uh, I think that's where it's so important that, um, that as you're climbing up the ladder, don't pull it up behind you, like help the women around you. I think um, that can be one of the most powerful ways um, for us to really sort of change the ratio. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? I worked on the Soccer World Cup years ago when it was in Japan and there were 300, we were doing a live broadcast and there were 300 producers and only two were women. And I must have been 20 in my early mid twenties or something. I was like, I've just said how old I was, but um, yeah, it was incredible because I think you don't you you don't know what you can be because you can't see what's in front of you. And there was no you know no mentors around. So I think female mentors too are important. Do you do you guys go out of your way to mentor, try and find young women to mentor? And absolutely, I I've been fortunate to have some really amazing mentors that um, have gone, and not just mentors, they've really been champions um, and, and giving advice, but then um, speaking and advocating for me in forums that I wasn't even a part of um, that really sort of built my credibility um, within the organization. So I try to pay that forward as much as I possibly can. And frankly, even if you're mentoring somebody else, you're getting so much on the other end of it of just sharing your advice, your perspective. It has you pause in a way and just kind of think about, Oh, what did I learn there? Um, and, and that can be as much of a gift um, in our own personal growth as it is for the person who's receiving that advice. Yeah, I feel like I still have a, a lot to learn before I, I can put myself out there as a almighty mentor, but I, I think I do feel so fortunate um, since joining the startup community. It's just incredible how much time people are willing to to give to provide insight and direction and and mentorship and so I, I feel really fortunate and definitely want to pay it forward once I have enough to offer others um, but uh, yeah it's been it's been really wonderful to be part of this startup community where people are really willing to go out of their way to sit down and have a conversation with you and 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 be a mentor Jessica, well, I suspect we've been through a huge barrier, though. I mean, the fact that that you raised six million in Series A, I mean, that is a, a had to have been a roller coaster journey of learning. I mean, that is a wealth of insight for you to share with others, too. So thank you. I think you're being way too modest. I think, <laughs> I think if you're a man, you would say I was a mentor five years ago. I'm ready to go. So I think you've just got to be be out there now. Be out there now helping helping lift them. Um, so we've got, we're going to start taking um, 
questions from the audience. And as I figure out what these are, what sports do you two watch now? Um, I love tennis. I love tennis. Um, so it was a tough choice at the time um, because cross country, um, same time, same season as cross country um, and tennis. So I ended up doubling down on running um, and kind of let my tennis game go to the um, side. But it's something that I've picked up recently. Our daughter takes um, lessons, um, really loving the strategy behind it. So um, huge. I was watching as much of the French Open as I possibly could. Yeah, I don't really sit down and watch a whole lot of anything at the moment, but I would also agree with Jenna that um, tennis has become probably my favorite sport to, to watch and also picking up a racket again and trying to get back out on the court. So you two, you two both played tennis, didn't you? Wasn't it a yep. yeah. offer of an option somewhere in there at some point? Was there uh, one? A, an option at one point, maybe? Oh, I, I dabbled in it in like the little Pepsi Junior Tennis League thing in the summer. So um, I, I guess I didn't see enough talent in myself to stick with that one. I was a little bit better on the running side of things. So <laughs> I went with more of the sure bet. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I love that I picked running because it's something that um, I run with uh, a group in our uh, neighborhood. Um, so we were out there this morning at 5.15. We call ourselves, ironically, the slugs. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's great to, to know that you already have somebody out there waiting for you. It's a, um, something you can always throw tennis shoes in the, in the bag. And when you're on a business trip, which we'll be on those again someday on the other side of this thing, um, you know, it's such an easy sport to um, keep healthy. And, um, and there's so many races for causes and things like that that are amazing. Um, Definitely wish I had kept up on tennis a little bit more, um, but it is definitely, it's a, it's a new challenge and love for me to kind of pick up the racket and, and uh, relearn how to, you know, have a proper grip and have an actual strategy in the game. Nice. Nice. It's good to hear that you still, or both of you still exercising and because I think it does help, especially in stressful times, you know. It does, yeah. We've had a poll running this whole time, um, and it has asked, "What level did you go into in your sports journey?" And we have twenty nine percent of said college, ten percent said T ball. I don't. What's T ball? <laughs> it's uh, like baseball <laughs> when you're five or six years old. Oh, when you hit that. Oh, right. Okay. I don't, I think this is Ryan's sense of humour here that I'm not quite, <laughs> anyway, most people played college sport is what I'm getting from that. Okay, we've got some good, um, we've got some good questions over here. We have one from Monica Finley. Founding a company has a lot of hurdles to overcome. How do you keep track of it all? Um, do you have a personal secretary? Automation software, a combination? Uh, Jenna, I don't have up. a personal secretary. <laughs> that would be wonderful. <laughs> so just a, just a diary? What have you got? Uh, you know, I really, I think it just depends on what stage of growth you're in. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, definitely keeping very close track of your to-do lists. Um, we internally use... Um, as team communication, Slack um, is, is a much better tool um, than email for just that back and forth communication. Um, Asana for project management. Um, and then, yeah, those are probably the two main things that we use as a team collectively and, and personally. I have my to-do list in my, in my own private Slack channel. Nice. And Jenna, I know you're organized because one of your favorite sayings is have your plan and work to your plan. Exactly. No, it's, it's true. And um, yeah. And going back to juggling a lot of things um, you're, you're juggling sort of everything at work. You're also juggling a lot of things at home too. So I have a running list of, of things that need to be checked off and accomplished. Um, I personally use um, OneNote quite a bit, um, easy way to kind of organize and then I can, 
I, when I'm struggling to remember somebody's name, because especially when you're building out something like sports tech, it's a whole ecosystem of partners. And, and, um, and so I can quickly, oh, what was that person's name? And then I quickly look it up. And so I take copious notes. My memory is, um, I like to joke that I got, you know, pregnancy brain, and then it transitioned into mommy brain, and now it's COVID brain. So I have a lot of lists. Um, I can directly link in um, documents and things like that um, within there as well, too. So I use that quite a bit. I think you do something too, Jenna, that not many other people do. You you read your emails. like <laughs> Yes. Yeah, there is a sense of accomplishment of feeling that you have to really <laughs> get as close to empty on the inbox as possible yeah and that i can imagine that's hard on your inbox yeah. um we've got one here from jennifer gruskoff who are the top female sports icon that have influenced you the most Obviously, Sam Kerr, the Australian soccer captain. I don't know, I don't know why. I don't know why you. It, what's taking you so long to say her name? That's right. That's right. She's definitely one of them. Has anyone else come to mind? <laughs> um, gosh, that's a that's a good question. Um, I I would. I mean, I could think of a lot of different female athletes like Serena Williams love her just just she's amazing on the court and I love the way she doesn't back down from um sometimes just annoying questions that she gets um who else um I'm not it's a really good question um I will, I will build off this Serena Williams. My head went there first too. Um, and she's also amazing when it comes to being a smart investor. And I, I think it's really interesting that she hasn't, she hasn't gone into um, necessarily sports tech from an investment standpoint, but it's really more about um, what are um, universal problems that women have and really investing there. Um, so I think she's um, incredibly smart um, incredibly um, willing to speak her mind and um, stand for causes. So huge one there. Um, Allison Felix is another one for me as well. Um, the fact that she really took a stance when, um, that, that sponsors kind of pulling away from athletes just because they get pregnant. <laughs> Like her career wasn't over. She took a real strong stance in that. And I think it was, um, it's those types of things that really advance opportunities for, for a lot of, a lot of female athletes to don't hold us to a different standard because we have the privilege of starting a family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. <clears throat> we have another question here, a very thoughtful one from Chris Graham from the National Racing Network. He asks, he says, our core market of auto racing is traditionally male dominated and still lags behind other sports media in having females in roles of power, which are forward facing. What advice can you give on helping us to develop women into leadership roles and breaking the stereotype barriers which still exist in some sports? Yeah, that's a, I mean, I guess I would go back to the, in some respects, you need to see it to be it. Um, and that can, you know, you have high profile drivers that kind of break the mold there and aspire, um, inspire the, the younger generation of girls to get out there and even consider this as a sport. Um, and then I think it's also, you know, it, it's a double edged sword too, that when, um, if there aren't the stories to talk about female drivers, then it's less likely you're going to have a female commentator in there that has relevant experience that they can take from being an athlete to then transitioning over to the broadcast booth. So I think it's in a lot of different areas. Um, it's in how you market. Um, and so having you know female leaders, strong female leaders that have that multicultural marketing background and experience um, they'll come with those fresh ideas that make the sport a little bit more accessible um, so that more and more of our, our youth see it as a, as a path. And so you can see sports that have done that well, can't you? Yes, you know, 
absolutely. Mm -hmm. Just Jessica? Yeah, I would just add to that too. I mean, it's a great question. And I think just making sure that decision makers um, include females around the table when these conversations are had and decisions are being made. Be, I've seen um, a lot of efforts being made where people, they, it's, you go into a room and how can we include more women? How can we include more women? And you look around the table and you're like, well, I'm the only woman here. So maybe actually include more women. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I see, and it's a great question. And, and just ensuring that when the conversations um, and approaches are being um, you know, discussed that, that there are females around the table to provide some fresh insight. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, about diversity again, there's only, you know, you only win by adding, having more diversity, don't you? Cause you have more, mm -hmm. the stats are out there as to what diversity does to your company. There's no reason to, to be behind the eight ball on it. Um, we've got another one here. You mentioned building a team. This is from Greg Flaccus. Hello, Greg. You mentioned building a team. What are the key things you look in for doing that? Um, so for us, we, we actually have a set of core values. And so every person that we interview goes through a skills assessment and we make sure that they are well qualified to, to fill the position that we're hiring for. But we also do a culture fit um, portion of the interview process and we have questions aligned to all of our core values. Um, and then we also, you know, try to get the person, get to know the person on a personal level. And, you know, is this someone that um, is going to um, fit in well with our current culture and, and also help us grow as a team as we talked about earlier making making sure we we aren't just um, opening the door to the person the loudest person in the room or the person that is able to grab our attention the easiest but at really thinking critically about what this person is going to bring to the team and and how they're going to help us um, grow in in areas that we may be currently weak in definitely yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the, like you said, Kylie, the data, it, it absolutely bears it out that the more diversity that you have, um, the more revenue that you bring in. And it's because it's diverse ideas, it's diverse perspectives. And, um, and in general, I think, yes, you have to have a cultural fit, but you also have to have some of the different thinkers in there too that kind of challenge the culture. The principles should remain the same, really what you, the values of what you stand for, absolutely but it's the fresh perspectives that set, set the, the companies apart. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I guess those perspectives when they don't match yours can be confrontational, you know, confronting for you at times, but in the end, it'll lead you to better outcomes. Um, off the back of that. It you, it's, it's that open mindset that we were talking about earlier, um, that if you're, if you're truly um, listening to more and different perspectives, Sometimes you uncover a completely different approach in there. And unless you're willing to sit back and really listen and um, let that guide, so it's both feel and facts around things, um, I think that's where you end up with better decision making in the end. Definitely. We have Lowell Whiteman. Hello, Lowell. How are you? The women of the M WNBA have been champions for social justice. What do you see in your space that is moving the needle in social justice? I can speak to that from the standpoint of Comcast. I think, um, you know, I often joke it's sometimes a national pastime to hate your cable company, but I do, I am more and more proud of working for Comcast than I probably ever have before. We started off um, years ago with internet essentials, providing low-income families with um, internet access, $9.99 a month. Um, we have now expanded that tremendously um, by adding lift zones, so safe places where kids can come, especially now, do their homework. Um, it's a digital world that's closing that digital um, divide in a huge way. Um, we recently made a $100 million social justice commitment um, that will be a multi-year initiative to really close that digital um, equality gap out there um, in meaningful ways. And a lot of that will be grants to nonprofits. We have a foundation, but I think it's, um, and, and we even yesterday as an organization um, had three hours dedicated in the middle of the day where our employees got together 
um, to hear from our leadership about what we're doing um, internally within the culture, um, what we're doing for our customers, what we're doing to build off platforms like Internet Essentials, um, the farm, um, our accelerator, um, open innovation hub, it's always been about supporting the under-supported, um, really helping to develop and prepare diverse founders for investment ready opportunities and marketplace success. And so I think um, there are a number of ways that um, we can all make a difference and it's gonna be the small things that incrementally add up to big lasting change. And there's a lot of work to be done and we will be just a small part of it, but I'm proud of the dedication of what our company is saying um, is important and what we're committed to doing. Fantastic. And Jessica, if you... Yeah, I mean, I probably can't speak to that, that level. Uh, <laughs> we're four years into this journey, but um, one thing that I, I think that we are really proud of is, is our um, team and we, we have a position, we call them wing moms. And so they are our workforce that process all of the inventory that we receive from sellers in the community. And they are typically, um, stay-at-home moms or moms that have, uh, like we talked about earlier, left the workforce to stay home with their kiddos and are just trying to either re-enter the workforce or um, maybe just kind of get their foot in the door somewhere and, you know, work their way up. And it's been really awesome to see um, the, these women come in and um, get a, a sense of self-confidence and, and really um, just, they've been incredibly um, amazing support to Goodbye Gear and helping us grow. And we've got several of these swing moms that, you know, started out four hours a week for us processing inventory and then they were doing eight hours a week and then it was 12 hours a week and then they were taking on customer service and, and pretty soon we're like, well, you're really good at product development. Why don't you help us with product development? And, and now we've got several of these original wing moms that are full-time equity owning um, employees of the company and it's it's been really awesome to see um, their journey um, and so we're really excited about that um, wing mom role that we have in our, on our team. That's amazing and we also know from this pandemic more so how important employment is to people's sense of well-being and sense of self. Mm -hmm. um, we have Chris Graham back because I kind of like his his questions from the National Racing Network. Hello Chris! Um, he says the way men and women um, can be motivated can be wildly different. Do you women have any um, advice on how to push a younger woman we see um, into le the leadership positions? Hmm. If she doesn't see it yet in herself is what he says. Maybe tell her. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I um, tell her, I think that is a great, um, yeah, I think, I mean, if I were to tie it back to sports too, there, um, there's this sort of intrinsic passion to, um, to get out there every day to make yourself better than you were the day before. And if you can have that same passion in, in what you do and be purpose driven in your job, I think you have natural success. You have natural confidence that comes from that. Um, you know, there's a lot of, and, you know, Jessica, I think you made a great point of these wing moms that, um, that it gave them a platform to come back in to the workforce, um, but it gave them confidence. It's a reminder of um, as much of what you do at home is 100% transferable over into the workplace. Um, you were dealing with so many competing things. Um, priorities, um, time management. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's remarkable how many of those skills are transferable. And, um, and so I, I love that story of, of it gave them a place to come back in. Um, I think it's just another area where we all just need to be a little bit more open-minded to um, the choice to stay at home doesn't mean that your skills have lessened in any degree. And, um, and so anything that gives women um, the opportunity back in um, and, and to rebuild that confidence because, yeah, it's, it's hard sometimes to get the resume in front of the right people that are going to be willing to look past a little gap on that resume. Absolutely. That's a great point. And I, I think in general, 
most people have different motivations um, or different things that motivate them. Even, um, even, you know, women internally have different things that motivate them. So really just finding out what it is that motivates that individual is probably the first step. And, and um, as, as Jenna and Kylie mentioned, just having a frank conversation with that person and letting them know you think they are demonstrating some great leadership skills and you, you'd like to help them you know, work their way up and, and what is it that they need to, to take on the skills that they may think they're lacking. And um, yeah. So. I suspect it's a conversation she'll remember for the rest of her life. Like it'll be one of those pivotal conversations. Mm -hmm. um, Jenna, Monica Finley has asked you, although Jessica, you may have an answer to this too. I don't want to, what sports technology are you most excited about? Oh, yeah. So we, um, and I can't name names of some of the startups that um, are in our selections process right now, but um, I'll talk a little bit more on our investment categories. Um, anything around player um, uh, and athlete performance, I think is um, such a unique and dynamic place. Um, I would love nothing more than, um, you know, eight years from now when the Olympics is taking place in LA that one of those athletes um, had time um, really honing and shaping on their path to the podium using some of that technology. So the athlete and player performance piece, I think there's enormous um, potential there. Um, we're seeing some really fascinating stuff when it comes to um, just making it more interactive and immersive around the fan experience. And um, so, uh, you've seen it happen within COVID where we all had to get really sort of creative when fans weren't there. Um, and uh, you, you had Bundesliga where they were probably the first to put in the cardboard cutouts of fans. Not a, not a tech um, solution, but the fact that they tied it back to, um, you know, that charity money going to first line workers and responders. Um, I think it's just a nice reminder that technology can come in the form of new business models that can come in the form of, of hard tech that solves problems like latency so that um, you know you can have a video data overlay and real-time analytics um, that help you understand the nuances of the sport differently so there's all facets of it and it's been really refreshing to see I think we had over 800 startups apply and so the mere fact that we're getting them down to this um, and, and next week, it's the decision board where we have the final interviews with the most promising startups and their teams to really dig in, ask more questions, and really make it clear um, what's the type of advice and support and opportunities that we can unlock for them within the accelerator program. Yeah, I think I read a quote the other day on the first thing you mentioned about performance that said some sports are at the physical peak of where a human can go. It will be technology that makes the next improvements for them which is interesting. Jessica, have you got a favourite sports tech? I do not. <laughs> um, we have a wonderful person on community, Mary Lou McFarlane. And Jessica, she just says to you, congratulations on your raise. Such an exciting and important business. Thank so you. And so does Kelly Pratch. For Jessica, awesome on the Series A, advice to female founders in sports tech to find the right investors. How do, how do, how do women go about finding investors? Are women equal to men at finding investors? I think there's definitely a concerted effort right now to try to level that playing field. Um, you know, to be perfectly honest, I, I, it's definitely still not level yet. And I think it goes... Um, kind of along the same lines of uh, just not having enough female in those decision-making positions. So when you're going to meetings and talking to investors, especially for us trying to pitch this idea about reselling baby and kid gear and you're talking to a room of older men like th that don't always connect with the problem um, as intimately as maybe someone else that has young kids at home and as a mom herself. Um, so that, that was a challenge for us, but I think just doing your homework, being very organized with your list of investors that you're targeting, um, do your, do some research. Are, are they even interested in the type of business that you're developing? You can usually figure out what sort of thesis um, different investors have and what types of businesses they're investing in. So 
don't spin your wheels trying to talk to as many people as you possibly can. Narrow in on the people that are actually interested in your space. And then just, you know, don't be intimidated. Well, the, and there's still a big massive gap, isn't there, between men being funded and women, Jenna? Is that still... There's still a massive gap there, and there's a lot of um, studies and research that, and you you may have even experienced this as well, Jessica, of, of the way that um, investors ask question of men versus women is very different as well. With men, it's a little bit more open mind. Well, tell me about your business model, whereas it's almost leading with how could this possibly work? What have you thought about? And and again, it's. It goes back to one of the earlier comments um, that so much of it does hinge on confidence, and um, and that's a very it's a very different experience in the room when it's led from an open-minded type of a question or one that sort of goes to let's isolate and pinpoint the problem first. Um, that could wear away at your confidence. So I think it is a huge accomplishment that um, that you broke through the barriers of that. I think. There is a lot more open-mindedness to it now. There's a focus and an attention on it, um, but it's a long journey and path. And to your point, there, are, I think there's less than I think I read a stat less than two percent of investors are women. Um, so it goes exactly to your point that um, an investor needs to really associate and understand the problem in an intimate way, and um, and a mom in your case. Is going to be one that that resonates for me. I mean, when when we um, when we were prepping for this, I said I needed your company <laughs> four years earlier. Um, I think you know there were many times, even in Philadelphia, where uh, if you want to donate um, something to, um, it, there are certain rules and regulations in the state of you can't donate anything that a child has sat in before. <laughs> so it's like, okay, well, <laughs> then all of a sudden your, your basement is full of all this stuff that um, just sits around idle unless you have friends and the right timing and all of these things. And so um, I think you've, you've created, and it's something that we need, right? Um, some of the stuff is barely worn, barely used, um, and it needs to go to families that need it. Yeah, we need you in one of our commercials that will right. broadcast on Comcast. <laughs> there you go. Doesn't it also create safety, not having to go on Craigslist and out to yeah. people's home, I assume? Yep. Exactly. Yeah, you don't, um, yeah, you do start to question when you're like driving over to pick up a bunch of clothes. You're like, I don't even know this person and mm -hmm. I'm going to knock on their front door. <laughs> Um, so we've got to wrap up and thank you so much for your time. But there's one more question from Mark. Um, he coached young girls. I think it's a nice way to end. And I think we know that by the time about 13, the drop-off rate's really high, isn't it, for girls in sport? Um, what advice would you give to parents and coaches to inspire young women to continue competing? Yeah, I... Um... I think, you know, when you're coaching young girls, that is a moment where you can build their confidence in a different way um, and encouraging them to stay in it. And, you know, that's also that age where your body starts changing and, um, and, and there was something for me that made me feel like an, uh, more powerful to own my body and to know what I was capable of and uh you know push myself to the limits and so um and maybe in a weird way that built some confidence for me as well so yeah stick with it as much as you can make that um a fun and inviting and not too competitive so that when the kids get back in the car it's not oh why didn't you do this it's did you have fun what did you learn today yeah i think um, keeping it fun, providing options. I think one thing that I was very fortunate is even though soccer did appear to be the direction I would be heading in terms of a post high school sports career, so, so to speak, I, I was never forced to quit all the other sport, sports that I enjoy playing. Um, and I think had I been forced to just focus on soccer alone, I, I probably would have burned out. And so I think providing um, options and, and flexibility to enjoy other 
if it's another sport or another hobby or whatever it might be, but not staying solely focused on, on just one thing um, can keep it fun and interesting. Definitely. Well, thank you both for spending a lovely hour with us. It was great to talk. And isn't it a privilege just to talk about women? <laughs> yes, it was. And thank you for both the men and women that joined us in the um, chat because they were a really great question. Yes, thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you. And I think the next uh, webinar is at how you've got a NASCAR driver. It's a yes. change of gear. <laughs> Well done, Kay. <laughs> Do what I can. All right, everyone. Take care and thank you, Je thank you to Jenna and thank you to Jessica. Thank you. Thank you very much.